Well, thank you uh, for your attendance today to this uh, uh, podcast. Today, I have a, a pleasure to, to have with me uh, my friend, Dr. Uh, Francesco Blasi. Uh, and, and he's going to, in the first section, he's going to tell us about the lessons that he learned with COVID in his uh, city in Milan, his country, Italy. Uh, and then we're going to discuss a little bit of, if it is time, of how does he see COVID, the challenge of COVID now in 2021. And uh, to start, uh, Francesco, could you give us a, a little bit and, and a brief overview of your position now uh, in Milan, and then you can start with your lessons learned. Yes, thank you very much, Julio. Uh, it's a pleasure to, uh, to be here and uh, uh, sharing with you the, uh, the lesson we learned in uh, COVID-19. Uh, you know that Italy was the epicenter in Europe and we started the, the disease here and, and then uh, spread everywhere. Uh, I'm a professor of respiratory medicine at the University of Milan and uh, part of the Department of Pathophysiology and Transplantation uh, in my university. And in my hospital, that is the, the main university hospital in Milan, uh, I'm head of internal medicine department and run the cardiorespiratory unit and uh, cystic fibrosis adult center here in Lombardia, that is uh, the area around Milano. And uh, I work uh, uh, mainly on respiratory infection, I must say, uh, and my interests move from uh, COPD to lung transplantation and cystic fibrosis. Uh, the target of today is just to give you some ideas about what happened in uh, Italy and particularly in the area of Milan uh, during the, the last year. Uh, and uh, uh, just to give you, these are my, my disclosures. And uh, uh, I think that one of the points we, we had to, uh, was to uh, try to create stability in a time of instability. And we really had a time of instability starting around in February uh, next last year. And uh, we are still in a time of instability. And uh, how to uh, deal with uh, uh, this? Well, I think the evidence-based practice is the main point. And uh, clearly we see that how important is clinical expertise when you uh, deal with a new disease. And uh, certainly the research evidence are important. And uh, on the other side is also important to uh, look to what the patient wants. And uh, putting all together, probably you can have the best practice for dealing with the, uh, the disease. And clearly, uh, I think that uh, the virus, uh, the coronavirus uh, give us a, a really a, a rocket stimulus for uh, how to, uh, to manage healthcare in, in our, in our uh, area. And certainly one of the main problem was to how to deal with the, this infection in the community. And this is still one of the big problem in the management of the uh, COVID-19. And then clearly the stimulus was uh, to technology and we are looking and seeing how uh, important is technology uh, taking maybe the example of vaccination and uh, how, how fast was the uh, uh, preparation of the new vaccines uh, in, in, in eight months, we have uh, three or five uh, uh, new vaccines for, for the disease. And the other point is uh, to understanding the best care in terms of therapy to be applied in our patient. Uh, I remember the first two weeks in, in March uh, last year, we have a mortality of about 40% in my unit. And then we started to change our approach, our therapeutic approach, including steroids, uh, anti-inflammatory drugs, anticoagulation drugs, and then the mortality dropped down to 18%. So clearly, uh, this is very important and, and, and look to be uh, the, uh, how the, we can improve our, our approach. And I think one of the point is clearly to uh, evolve our, our uh, uh, medical care in, uh, for COVID, uh, understanding the, uh, the need of our patient, uh, understanding what we are doing and trying to standardize our approach, trying to have the same approach 
uh, in all the physician and nurses taking care of our patient and clearly trying to improve our approach and evolving our, our approach, both in terms of thera therapeutic approach, but also in, in general terms, our management approach. Uh, just to start, this is the, the, the first paper uh, published by, by our intensivists uh, from Milano, uh, looking to what happened in the uh, ICU admission in, uh, uh, in uh, uh, Lombardy, uh, the first uh, uh, 160, 100 patients. And uh, uh, what happened is that we uh, understanding immediately that the, the problem is related in terms of mortality and uh, severity of the disease is related to the uh, number of, of comorbidities and the kind of comorbidities the patient has. And the other point is the age of the patient. And clearly these are the, the two main points that uh, uh, appear to be uh, underlined by this paper. And uh, I'll show you uh, how this is, was confirmed by the other, other paper we published. One of the main problem was that we started with about 800 beds in ICU in Lombardy, in the area around Milano. And we finally have uh, in uh, April, more than 4,000 4, beds. Uh, but still the number of beds was not enough to treat all the patients that need uh, invasive ventilation. So we started really to look toward medicine, trying to find out the best possible care for our patient. And clearly we can't do the absolutely best care. So we try to select as better we can uh, the patient to be uh, uh, in ICU uh, and try to give the best opportunity to, to, uh, to our patient. And clearly it was very hard uh, to choose the patient to be intubated and the patient that should be not intubated. Uh, we change our, our approach uh, and management starting from the emergency room. Uh, we divided our uh, emergency room in two uh, separate uh, sections. Uh, one where the, the patient with a, a suspected COVID and the other without any, any suspicions. And then the triage was very important uh, because we, this, we uh, shift the patient from one uh, of the, uh, the three columns, uh, the green pathway, yellow red pathway, and the triage for non-COVID non patient. And we divided the, 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 the emergency room with dedicated radiologists, uh, one for suspected COVID and the other for non-suspected COVID. And then we go through the, the, uh, the uh, pathway uh, till the possible discharge or uh, uh, moving the patient uh, to a uh, high dependency unit or general ward or ICU or uh, going for uh, a non-COVID. Uh, this was very important starting from the very uh, 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 early time in, in uh, uh, COVID. And uh, one of the main point was to uh, educate the, uh, the, the uh, personnel. Uh, and this was very, very important because we are not used to uh, PPI uh, and uh, uh, the management of the uh, uh, safety for the personnel was very important. And this is the scheme we used in, in, our, in our hospital uh, uh, trying to have a, uh, you know, lectures and live demonstrations, then in situ simulation, and then random calls to try to understand if the people is ready for uh, these, this new approach to the patient. And this was not only involved the ICU, but all the healthcare uh, uh, workers in, 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 our, in our hospital. And uh, we have specific training programs, particularly for the management of respiratory failure, for the use of dispositive for protection and the electronic records. And we had a lot of work. We have over 3,800 3, patients that was, uh, sorry, health personnels that had the uh, training section and uh, trying to really to give all the possible information to our workers. And the other point, point is this one the psychological support. It was, it was important in the first wave, but it was even more important in the second wave. And now 
because clearly the first wave was, uh, uh, you know, uh, a new things. Uh, all the people uh, are heroes and working for the uh, saving lives. But the second wave was very hard to support because, uh, you know, the, the patient uh, relatives and health personnel were uh, uh, had a fatigue of COVID. And it was very important to have this kind of service. And the, the other point was how to manage respiratory failure and the increased oxygen requirement in the hospital. We moved from uh, 140 uh, square uh, cubic meters per hour to almost six times more. And this needs technical adjustment of the plants. And the, also the helmet CPAP use moved from uh, 10 to 20 a day to more than 140 a day. So we need to you know, uh, uh, make a lot of efforts to have more oxygen and more uh, equipment for, for dealing with the needs of patients. And the other point is this was how we, we organized my own unit. Uh, we decided to have a multidisciplinary team uh, involving in the eye dependency unit pulmonologists and cardiologists. We decided to have a cardiorespiratory unit with 44 beds uh, where the patients are ventilated but are followed also by cardiologists directly. And the idea was to, to give the, for all the, for each of the uh, uh, physician and nurses, a specific uh, uh, in, uh, way to work and uh, the respiratory physician was uh, clearly uh, involved in the initial evaluation of the patient, choice of respiratory support, identifying the signs of sepsis or multi-organ failure and so on. We have a fellows that help the respiratory physician in working this and the fellows were from the respiratory and cardiologist. And uh, the nurse clearly had the, the role, the specific role we have physiotherapists, we have 10 physiotherapists working with us, and it was very important for evaluation of the respiratory uh, ventilator oxygen support and for early mobilization of the patient. And the cardiology had the uh, important role in evaluating the patient, in deciding the uh, uh, therapy for uh, uh, hypertension, uh, management of cardiac complication that we know very well in COVID are important. And then we have consultants. We have the infectious disease consultants, rheumatologists, and intensivists. The intensivist make the, uh, comes to our uh, ward twice a day, in the morning and in the evening, to evaluate the patient and discuss with us the uh, opportunity for uh, intubation or non-intubation of the patient. And then we decided to have a, something standardized in some way about the use of, of different uh, uh, respiratory support uh, according to the PF ratio and respiratory rate. Taking account of these two uh, uh, parameters, we have to, we decided to separate the different uh, uh, use of different, from the high flow oxygen to helmet CPAP to uh, uh, NIV or intubation of our patients. And uh, we try to standardize as, as soon as possible the, uh, the, the therapeutical approach, starting from antipyretic drugs to treatment of systemic hypertension using uh, dif different uh, 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 antihypertensive drugs. And I, I will discuss with you later the use of uh, uh, carinone, or spironolactones, uh, and uh, AC uh, inhibitors, and so on. Hydration, hydration is important. Nutrition is very important. In many patients, there was no possibility to have a, a, a oral uh, nutrition. So we have to put uh, a nasal feeding tube or uh, enteral feeding. Sedation is important, particularly in patients coming from the uh, intensive care unit. We have delirium in many patients after a long uh, uh, time of, of intubation. Uh, end of life support is also very important try not to make the patient suffer for, for the, you know, for, uh, the uh, respiratory failure and the gastric protection, particularly in patient treated with anticoagulation. Look into the data. The number of, of comorbidities are very important uh, and correlate with mortality, 
And the same is for age. Clearly, age, being uh, 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 older than uh, 65 years is, is important in terms of risk of mortality. And uh, uh, we look to the use of uh, LMS CPAP treatment in, uh, in COVID, uh, looking to CPAP success and CPAP failure. I report here some of the parameters that are important, particularly the part of inflammation. Uh, the CPAP failure is more frequent when you have a high level of inflammation, uh, high level of risk for uh, uh, thromboembolisms, and clearly the, uh, uh, the rate of uh, the uh, level of VO2 is also important. If you need a very high level of VO2, the risk of CPAP failure is higher. So it's very important to uh, uh, look to the patient. And the other point is the uh, prone positioning in patient with uh, uh, treated with Almet CPAP. This is a prospective course study uh, published in, in the Lancet. And uh, uh, they look to, uh, it's from the, our, uh, our group of intensivists, and they look to the possibility to prone positioning and they see that there is a, a good effect of the, uh, of the prone positioning. Uh, and uh, uh, they uh, look to the possibility to make a long-term uh, prone positioning. What we did is look to look to prone positioning and also to lateral positioning. Uh, we published this paper in, in chest and uh, uh, you can see that in some patients it works, in some others it doesn't work. So it's very important. This is uh, after one hour and you can see that the what happened in the first hour probably is important to understand if the prone positioning or lateral positioning is working in our patient or not. And uh, uh, this is a clearly needs more, more patient, but it's clearly important in understanding the, the possible role of prone and lateral positioning of patient in CPOP. The other point is that uh, the, the patient are different. Uh, we have a patient with different compliance and different shunt fraction, and this lead to uh, some uh, uh, look into the uh, in depth of the possibility that the patient had different response and different kind of uh, acute respiratory distress syndrome uh, in uh, in COVID, and this lead to this paper. This is a very controversial paper. You know that uh, there are a lot of commentary in different journals, and uh, uh, particularly in the Lancet, in, uh, in the Blue Journal, uh, in the Intensive Care Medicine Journal, after this publication of Luciano Gattinoni and the group of uh, intensivists on Milan. And they look to the two possible uh, phenotypes, type L and type H, uh, the type L is uh, a patient with the uh, COVID pneumonia present with the low elastance, low ventilation to perfusion ratio, low lung weight and long lung recruitability. And in this patient, the suggestion is to treat with an increase in VO2 uh, and in non-invasive support. In this kind of patient type H, where you have high elastance, high right to left shunt, high lung weight and high lung recruitability. In this kind of patient, the indication is to treat a severe IFDS and with higher PEEP and a clearly prone position and an extracorporeal support like ECMO. This paper uh, was really controversial, but it's interesting because leads to a, a, a huge discussion about the physiology of the LDS in, in COVID. Uh, let's look to the, the uh, role of some, uh, some uh, scores. Uh, we use this course, we published this paper uh, uh, in uh, later this uh, last year, and we look to the uh, use of this score, that is a score for uh, uh, thromboembolism, risk of thromboembolism in, in, in the lung. And clearly the higher the score, the higher is the risk of mortality and intubation. And this is our core curve. Uh, it is not so good, but it's not so bad. And uh, certainly the, the, this, risk this risk score may be useful to identify the, the, the patient at risk. And uh, looking to the uh, risk factors, again, age is important. Again, uh, the comorbidities are important, particularly the uh, 
hypertension seems to be an important risk factors for mortality. And again, uh, the cardiorespiratory unit is important because at the end of the day, uh, the COVID uh, imply the involvement of both the, the heart and lung. And this is a nice paper published, published from the, uh, another group here in Milan and in Bergamo. And they look to the hemodynamic profile of COVID-19. And they found that there are a combined cardiopulmonary alteration uh, in leading to a low pulmonary vascular resistance with a blunted epoxy vasoconstriction. And this lead to a post-capillary pulmonary hypertension. So it's very important to take into account the interaction be between lung and, 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 and heart. And indeed, we published this paper in the Journal of American College of Cardiology, uh, looking to the echocardiograph uh, problem and abnormalities. And we look to the different abnormalities, both in the left ventricular wall motion and global dysfunction, but also the right ventricular dysfunction. And clearly, there is a overlap of this, of this problem, but almost all the patient has some uh, uh, echocardiography abnormality. So it's very important to take into account that myocardial injury is very, very frequent in, in patients with COVID-19. And again, uh, comorbidities are important in terms of uh, in-hospital death, but it's also important to, uh, you know, to perform echocardiography because Echocardiography abnormalities are related with an inordination ratio of almost four for, you know, in, in terms of mortality. So it's very important to have a cardiologist in your unit looking to uh, uh, abnormalities of uh, uh, wall motion, you know, of heart wall motion particularly. And certainly uh, uh, thrombosis is important. Microthrombosis is important. These are uh, post-mortem findings in uh, uh, patients uh, uh, of Bergamo, that is a, 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 the epicenter of the epicenter in, uh, in Lombardia. The first uh, uh, big shock we have in, uh, was in Bergamo. And clearly the, the, the uh, coagulation problems are important. And we look to this and uh, uh, what we uh, found is that it's important to look to uh, vulnerability factors and Adam ST13 axis. Uh, and uh, clearly the increase in the imbalance of this ratio is important because this is a, a measure of hypercoagulated state and the risk of microthrombosis in COVID-19. So clearly there is something at the level of endothelium that lead to microthrombosis, and that uh, at the end of the day it leads to thrombo uh, lung thromboembolisms. And uh, another point is hypertension. Hypertension is clearly important. This we published this paper uh, in, in a European Respiratory Journal, uh, looking to the uh, interaction between respiratory failure and hypertension. What we found is that most of our patients develop hypertension during the course of COVID and the uh, uh, hypertension is related to respiratory, severity of respiratory failure and mortality. And following this paper, we decided to look to the effect of uh, uh, um, carinone and spironolactone as, uh, as a possible uh, treatment for uh, hypertension in this patient. And indeed we found that the use of this kind of uh, anti uh, anti uh, hypertensive dark is important because the, the, there is a improvement in, in terms of survival and, uh, uh, and clearly this is important because we reduce the old case of mortality and you can lead to an, a clinical improvement in COVID-19 patients. So uh, this is a just, uh, you know, a few patients uh, still need uh, a confirmation. We are planning to have a randomized study on, on this uh, this uh, use of, of uh, carinone, and we will see the results in, uh, I hope, in the, in the next few months. The other problem is inflammation. As I said, we, after the first two weeks of March, we decided to start the use of steroids and to start the use of anti-inflammatory drugs 
uh, using a anakirna, that is an anti-interleukin-1 drug. And uh, we use the combination of methylprednisolone and anakirna. And uh, at the end of the day, the uh, results, uh, this is a retrospective analysis of our, of our results. And uh, you can see that there is a clear difference between the use of uh, anakirna combined with methylprednisolone compared to patients in standard of care treatment. So at the end of the day, it seems that steroids plus or minus an anti-interleukin-1, that is an advantage compared to anti-interleukin-6, uh, because in this case, the uh, activity on Akirna is, uh, is short, so you can stop the use if there is any uh, immunocompromise uh, in, in effect on uh, immunocompetency of your patient, and it seems to, be, to work very well. Now, one of the last uh, slides is this one. Uh, we are a center for lung transplantation. Uh, we suffer very much for COVID because we have a reduction by half of the number of lung transplantation in, in our unit. Uh, we passed from almost 40 to less than 20 lung transplantation, and this was related to the lack of donors. And uh, clearly, we have also a stop in the uh, uh, patient uh, in, in the list. And this was very, very, very important. And uh, on the other side, we have some patients with uh, 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 COVID-19 after lung transplantation. Uh, these are the, the first report on the first four cases we recorded, we uh, have been in our unit. And uh, three of them had a very uh, benign, benign and short-term outcome. Uh, at the end of the day, we have only a few days in the, in the, in the unit and uh, with a uh, very, very good uh, uh, outcome. Unfortunately, one of these patients died and uh, uh, the uh, pathologi pathological results was that uh, apparently COVID-19 uh, was the uh, uh, trigger for an uh, allograft dysfunction, probably inducing uh, rejection in our patient. And uh, this is important to take in account because uh, clearly uh, all the the infection can uh, start the, uh, uh, the uh, rejection, uh, but also COVID apparently uh, has this possibility. The other point is important is uh, the, this study. Uh, we perform, uh, we put together our, uh, uh, our population with a, a Spanish population uh, from Barcelona, Madrid and San Sebastian and uh, uh, look into a gene-wide association for the severe uh, COVID-19 respiratory failure. What we found is that uh, we uh, found two loci that are important for uh, genetic susceptibility to COVID. One is uh, on the uh, chromosome three, and one was the, uh, uh, related to the uh, ABO, uh, AB0 uh, blood group system. Uh, having A as the uh, worst outcome, the, the higher risk, uh, B intermediate risk, and zero the, the best uh, 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 outcome. And these are the uh, other uh, loci that are in interesting and are mainly related to response to virus and expression of AC2 in, on, on, on the cells. So at the end of the day, this seems to be related to the possibility uh, and the response to virus. And uh, there is clearly an, a, uh, an association with different alleles. So in conclusion, clearly uh, COVID-19 has been a rocket stimulus for uh, healthcare, uh, both in terms of uh, management, new technology uh, and, and, and new therapies. Uh, I think that one of the important point is that you had to think how to deal with the, uh, the disease and how to manage uh, trying to standardize your approach to the, uh, to the disease. Uh, on the other side, we uh, look to uh, different uh, approaches uh, in terms of ventilation, uh, using prone and lateral positioning in also in, in patient with uh, uh, non-invasive ventilation or CPAP. Uh, certainly, uh, some uh, uh, ideas that can be, there are different uh, phenotypes in uh, COVID-19 is interesting. Uh, we have a lot of discussion about this, 
but certainly physiology and pathophysiology of a disease is still uh, important to be studied and uh, uh, certainly new studies are very welcome. Uh, certainly uh, the uh, therapies, new therapies are important. Uh, the, uh, the use and the control of, of uh, hypertension seems to be important. Uh, certainly anti-inflammatory uh, drugs are important to control inflammation, knowing that the uh, 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 inflammation cascade and, and, and the storm, the cytokine, the so-called cytokine storm seems to be important in terms of outcome of our patients. So controlling inflammation seems to be mandatory in our patient. And then we identified uh, some uh, uh, genes uh, that can be uh, 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 activated and can be a uh, reason for uh, identifying the, the different uh, response to the disease in a different patient. So uh, a lot of studies still to go and uh, uh, still waiting for uh, new, uh, new information and new evidence that can lead us to a, 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 a better management and health care. So I want to thank you for your attention. This is part of my unit and some of my coworkers and what I want to thanks a lot because they are doing a lot of work and the fantastic work in, in, our, in our unit. And for this, I thank you very much for your attention. Well, thank you, um, Francesco. Uh, excellent uh, overview, a lot of things to, to discuss, but, but um, uh, this, uh, uh, conversation is going to be uh, placed on a, on a, a different websites and you can ask directly uh, to uh, Francesco. But let me ask you a, a couple of things based on this uh, very interesting presentation. The, the concept of, of hypertension, because I noticed that you have on a slide that hypertension is the most common comorbidity that you notice in your group. It's interesting, it has been our most common comorbidity here in Louisville and you look at articles now, uh, two questions. One, do you have, uh, in your prior work with pneumonia, no, pneumococcal pneumonia, visual, have you had hypertension in your mind as a, as a problem? Um, how do you connect the prior research on pneumonia with now COVID pneumonia and hypertension to so high? And then, and then uh, why do you think that, that hyper, because you mentioned there are two types of hypertension. One is the person that arrived with hypertension as a comorbidity, that is, is the most common comorbidity. And then the person that developed hypertension during the, during the hospitalization. Um, what is your, talking about pathophysiology, how do you put hypertension? What are you thinking? Well, uh, I must say that uh, you look into pneumonia as, as it is, uh, I, I never think to hypertension as a risk factor. <laughs> uh, then we know that, you know, a cardiovascular, uh, uh, like, uh, you know, a, a diseases like acute myocardial infarction are more probable in, in, in uh, pneumonia than uh, in, in other diseases uh, coming to the hospital. So clearly, uh, uh, cardiovascular diseases are important. One of the points where, well, we are looking to the possibility that, you know, in some way the infection that is related to the um, AC2 uh, receptor in some way can uh, uh, act on the aldosterone uh, uh, problems and, uh, and pathway. And so in some way uh, can uh, be a, a um, disequilibrium between uh, the uh, uh, renin angiotensin uh, pathway and aldosterone levels uh, that can lead to hypertension. And uh, so the idea to use uh, carinone as a possible drug start from the, this kind of, of uh, you know, uh, pathophysiology uh, hypothesis we, 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 we had. Uh, we are looking now to these uh, different pathways. Uh, I think we, we will have the, the data in the, the next few weeks uh, because we have samples from blood of, the, of our patient and we are looking to uh, the levels of uh, uh, angiotensin, renin and so on, and try to understand if there is any, any problem between you know, the uh, admission and uh, the patient who develop hypertension during the, the, the hospitalization, if there is any uh, problem in this axis, 
uh, and try to understand the, you know, the pathophysiologic basis of hypertension in, in these patients. Uh, talking about uh, our prior experience with pneumonia, the, again, as you alluded, hypertension was never too much of a comorbidity. Uh, but in, in other forms of pneumonia, the, the one of the primary reasons was smoking and COPD. But I noticed also in your data that COPD is almost non-existent. Uh, and again, I see, you see the same happened with our data in Louisville and data that, uh, why is that that COPD, smoking, what are all these things that cause that chronic lung disease doesn't seem to be to, to, to play such a critical role as we have it with pneumococcus or with other, yeah. or even with, with other forms of, of pneumonia. What, what do you make of, of, of well, this? I, I have no good explanation. One, one of the possibility is that, you know, <clears throat> uh, steroids, the steroids can do something. Uh, uh, because, you know, if you look to asthmatic patients, uh, you have clearly uh, some effects, uh, they you know, they, they have the reduction, uh, but severe asthmatics are not uh, uh, they a low incidence of COVID, uh, maybe related to biologicals, <laughs> related to the kind of inflammation and related to the use of steroids. Uh, and uh, in COPD, apparently the, you know, the, uh, the number of patients coming to the hospital with uh, having a secomorbidity COPD is not high, is not as expected. And uh, what we are seeing uh, is that if a patient with COPD comes to the hospital with COVID, uh, the outcome may be worse uh, than, than, than other patients. So maybe a risk factor for outcome maybe not a risk factor for coming to the hospital. Um, I don't have a, a very good expl explanation on this. Uh, we are look, seeing that also for our patient with bronchiectasis, we don't have a lot of patients with bronchiectasis. We don't have a lot of patients with cystic fibrosis coming to the hospital with COVID. But be, this may be related to the fact that these patients are used to be very cautious and they use masks, they are stay at home, avoiding contact with other people. So it's easier to explain why bronchiectasis and, and, and cystic fibrosis patients uh, have a lower incidence of, of COVID than expected. But for COPD, it's very difficult to, uh, to understand why. And maybe the use of steroids, maybe the, the I don't know what, 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 what can be the real explanation. Okay. Uh, and and uh, going another, uh, because you say that pathophysiology is so important, even though we don't know it, we don't understand the pathophysiology. Let me ask you uh, another question the pathophysiology. Do you think that, that, that this COVID pneumonia or, or the SARS-CoV-2 getting into the, get into the lung uh, uh, is, you will get into the oropharynx, is aspiration, is inhalation, do you think that, that is, there are some pneumonia that are hematogen or spread? spread? Uh, do you think that is, uh, some people suggest even the possibility of some form of autoimmune? I mean, what, what is running through your mind when you discuss with your group? What would be the, the pathophysiology? How is that these patients develop uh, COVID pneumonia? And also this, uh, because this also may imply also, like, how you extrapolate this pathophysiology with a, with a severe respiratory failure, what do you think is the pathophysiology of ARDS? You think that there are, there are really two types of ARDS, is one type that goes progressing to another one. What is your, your thought process regarding this at this moment? Well, look into the receptors for the virus. Uh, you have a, uh, you know, uh, along the, the airways, you have a, uh, the presence of receptors everywhere. And uh, so at the end of the day, uh, probably inhalation is a, the, the usual way of, of, of uh, uh, passing through the, from, from the mouth to, to, the, to the lung. Uh, what happened then, uh, I think is, uh, uh, is a matter of, of, you know, of uh, individual response in terms of uh, inflammation, in terms of number of, of uh, uh, receptors. Uh, maybe related to the uh, 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 viral viral loads uh, is is not very clear what happened. Uh, the the what we 
so is that when the patient comes to the hospital, that is usually after the first uh, seven to 10 days from the starting of the, of the, of the symptoms, uh, probably virus is no more the, the main problem, <laughs> but the, the main problem is inflammation. And um, uh, what we see, uh, you know, in, in what we saw in March uh, last year is that uh, when we started to use steroids, we have a, a change in, in, the, in the outcome of the patient. And we start steroids because on the, our experience as a pulmonologist, look into the lung and the, we have a ground glass appearance of the lung. And we think that inflammation is important and we started to use steroids. Uh, even if, you know, the, at that time, the WHO said, don't, don't use steroids uh, because it's a viral infection. And uh, uh, at the end of the day, uh, I think that it was, you know, uh, the pathophysiology is, is related to the number of, uh, probably to the, uh, you know, to the number of, of receptors, to the, um, maybe the genetics, uh, because we, we found that there are difference in terms of severity uh, according to the different expression of genes. And, uh, and the other point is clearly the, the level of inflammation, the response. Uh, this, you know, we know that in, in pneumonia, inflammation is important. Uh, your group published a lot of paper on this. <laughs> and uh, certainly is, is, uh, uh, inflammation is, is also important. It's not just a, a bacterial viral infection. And uh, so probably uh, there is a different response in different uh, subjects. And uh, so I think it's a very complex problem. <clears throat> but definitely you've seen the decreased mortality with the use of steroids. In your Absolutely, year. yeah, yeah. The, the, we started to use methylprednisolone at the same, uh, you know, dose we used. Uh, we published a paper some years ago with Meduri and uh, Confalonieri in the Blue Journal, and uh, and we used uh, the same uh, uh, the same approach with steroids. And uh, in some patients, we uh, use also pulse of, of steroids uh, to reduce the uh, the uh, inflammation. So using very high dose for three days. And then uh, going down with it, like we use for uh, uh, for you know rejection in, in lung transplantation, and uh, it's, it's a decision patient by patient. I must say, uh, we look to the patient if, if there is no response or there is an increase in the in the uh, ground glass appearance in in the lung. We started with high dose. Uh, we know very well that the, we increase the risk for many things because when you use high dose of steroids, you can have a problem. Uh, I must say that now we use uh, desametazone in, in many patients because we have a protocol on this. Uh, but uh, I think that in about half of the patient, we move from desametazone to methylprednisolone high dose uh, to have a response. Very good. Uh, and then you, you alluded to uh, lung transplantation. You have the experience. What would be the, what criteria are you using to say, okay, this patient may be a candidate for lung transplantation? How do, how do you see? Well, we, we transplanted two patients. Two patients. Uh, yes. One was a young patient of uh, 18, it was 18 years old. He was uh, intubated in another hospital. Uh, the, the situation was in no way. There is no improvement, nothing. The, the, the lung was completely destroyed. And uh, the, the other hospital uh, asked us to, to, you know, to consider the possibility of lung transplantation. Uh, we have a, a multidisciplinary discussion, a couple of days of discussion, I must say, we, because we analyze everything because the COVID was there. Uh, so uh, you know, the, the problem is was that we had to induce immunosuppression. And uh, so uh, at the end of the day, we decided to make a, a plasma uh, hyperimmune plasma uh, treatment. And then we decided to go for lung transplantation. Uh, and this guy is still alive and is in a good condition. And he was transplanted in uh, uh, April last year and it's, it still go very well. The other one was a, a, a 49 years old uh, guy. Um, it was uh, in the same situation. It was in, in, our, in our hospital. Uh, but the, in this case, the, the lung transplantation was a disaster. Uh, the, the patient uh, uh, after the lung transplantation was 
uh, again intubated, it was not possible to uh, avoid intubation. And uh, he died after two months of intubation after lung transplantation. Uh, so the, our experience is, is, is not so good uh, because, you know, the young one was, was good. Uh, I saw, you know, there are some, some reports uh, around the world. In China, was the, the, the transplanted four people and uh, three of them was, was, uh, was going well and one died. Uh, I, I think we don't have really uh, enough experience to say this. Uh, till now, we, it was really an emergency decision. It's not, it's not based on, on, on solid criteria. I understand, I understand. Then uh, this 18 year old, uh, I, uh, he was not having multi organ failure, was just mostly concentrated in the lung. You... Yes, it's, uh, the heart was uh, working, the, the kidney was working, the, lung, the liver was working. So the problem was lung. Lung was completely destroyed, was, was, was very impressive, really impressive. So we decided that there was no, no major problem in terms of uh, lung transplantation. And, uh, and uh, our, our surgeon uh, and our intensivist uh, with us decided to, to, to go for, and it was a good decision. But the one, other one, he, was, he had a, uh, a kidney failure, and, uh, and then this was the main problem, I think, uh, because he was on dialysis, and uh, it was not a good idea to transplant him. I see, I see. These have been a, a great, a lot of lessons that, that you learn. And I, 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 I like your, your concept that, that it's a new disease. And with a new disease, there's no evidence. There's no evidence based because we don't have evidence. Then, then, then experience is critical when you don't have uh, evidence and, and the multidisciplinary approach uh, and the standardization. Now, in the last couple of minutes, I would like to uh, ask you, you know, now looking at this year, 2021, uh, as as uh, challenges for 2021, you uh, alluded the concept of, of what could be the the uh, the chronic the not the chronic fatigue the, the COVID fatigue the the COVID fatigue in your group because you've been there at the front uh, and people in these units like your unit I mean it's um, uh, how do you see this uh, and, and what is the way to to move forward because as these new waves keep coming all over the world. I can see that the that the COVID fatigue is something that is going to be a universal problem. Yeah, uh, you know the the, the the first approach in the in the first wave uh, when we we open the the unit, uh, all of us uh, you know feel feel like you know we were heroes. Uh, we are working uh, against the new virus, and uh, we are very strong, uh, working all together. Uh, the group was very, very uh, strong, uh, and uh, uh, we, you know it was it was a great time. Uh, nurses, physiotherapists, cardiologists, re respiratory disease people, all working together, and uh, it was really a, a, a good time for all of us in terms of you know feeling. Uh, after the you know then we we have a couple of months uh, where we work uh, as a pulmonologist, <laughs> not a COVID specialist. <laughs> And, uh, uh, and then we had to reopen the unit. And uh, it was really, really, really difficult because uh, people uh, were really afraid to have a, you know, the idea to stay another year with, the, with COVID, working on this kind of patient, looking to people dying uh, with a really high, high, high frequency of, of, you know, 20% is very high uh, mortality. And, um, uh, look into you know, and uh, at the end of the day, uh, we uh, we started with the psychological support, and uh, I must say that I have three or four of my co-workers going regularly to the uh, psychologist visits uh, to have the support, and uh, I meet uh, each of, of them uh, because I think that you know having a, a, an exchange of experience is important. And, uh, and uh, now we are uh, every, every week, one meeting all together, trying to, you know, to restart our, our, our souls. <laughs> and then start saying, you know, we are working for, for, the, for the people and uh, trying to, you know, to improve. And this is, was also related to the fact that, you know, uh, the population in Italy and the first wave uh, consider physicians and nurses uh, like heroes. Now, 
they are starting to say, well, you didn't do exactly what you had to do. And so I asked to my lawyer to look to what are you doing? So, you know, there is also this kind of stress now. So I think the, you know, the psych psychological support is very important, particularly in the second wave, because the fatigue is, is there. And, be, and be, this, is, this is very good. This is very good experience and very good advice. Uh, and before I let you go, uh, I need to ask you uh, the question of, of okay, what, what, what do you think that the vaccines are going to fix of this, or if anything? Because I can see that the, uh, the vaccine may help us not to get COVID, but as you say, going there to the unit and having 20% mortality and uh, being separated for the patient with all this uh, uh, protective equipment. I don't think that the, the vaccine is going to resolve. You know, but how do you see vaccine? How is the vaccine going in your area, in, in, in Milan, in Italy? And uh, how do you see the vaccine for these coming years? Well, I think it, it will take about one year to, uh, for the vaccination of the, of the Italian population, uh, considering that we plan to vaccine all, all the people over 16. Uh, that means uh, about uh, 45 million <laughs> people. Uh, it is not an easy task. Uh, uh, I started, I was one of the first in, in, in December to be vaccinated and I waited for the second dose uh, in, in, in a couple of days. Uh, but uh, uh, I think that the, the main problem is that probably uh, vaccines will leave us a little bit of, you know, uh, reducing the, uh, the pressure on, on, on the hospital. Because if you, we can uh, prevent in some way the more severe cases in the elderly would be uh, a great help for, you know, controlling the situation. Because uh, the, the, our problem now is that our emergency room is again plenty of people with COVID. Our beds in the, in the hospital are plenty of people with COVID. And clearly, we don't have time to, to look to the other patient, the COVID negative, uh, with uh, myocardial infarction or of, of COPD or asthma exacerbation. And this is very, very, very important. Uh, so I think that the, what we expected from vaccine is to, to, to re reduce the pressure, not to solve completely the problem. I think that this disease will become in some way endemic in our, in our population, like Legionella infection. Uh, we will have some patient up with COVID, uh, but the, the, the importance is to reduce the pressure to the, in the, uh, to the health system. And, and uh, clearly there are logistic problems uh, because going to, uh, to vaccinate so, so, so many people is, is very difficult. Uh, uh, our our uh, system is not ready because this is the first time we, we have to vaccinate 45 million of people. And uh, it's clearly, uh, we have to think uh, how, how to, to, to deal with. And uh, now we started with the uh, health workers, but it's very easy. They are in the hospital. Uh, or each hospital is vaccinating his, his own people. And, but then uh, we had to go outside and, and go into the community and, uh, and, and try to vaccinate uh, 100, probably 100,000 uh, a week or more, and uh, this is a this is a big problem, and uh, so we will see. We will see. Hoping that will uh, help us very much. I must say. <laughs> well, let me say that uh, this was a, a great conversation. We're almost at, at, at one hour. I, I, thank you for 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 accepting um, uh, our invitation for our you know International Respiratory Infection Society, all the group for Capo, and all the all, all the friends. Uh, uh, again, as we discussed, this is not the same that being face to face when we get together in the international meetings. Let's hope that that at least the vaccination is going to resolve this issue that we can be face to face in some meeting uh, in a couple of months. But yes, a lot of challenges, a lot of things to learn. Uh, thank you for your thank you for your time, and and we keep in contact. Uh, thank you very much. It was really great time for me. Thank you. Thank you, thank you Julio. See you. See you. Bye.